everyone, I'm Kelly Gannon, an account manager at Cell Signaling Technology, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Learning Lab Live session. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Virginia Bain, one of our scientists at Cell Signaling who um, specializes in validating reagents for immunofluorescence experiments. Today we're going to discuss equipment considerations for immunofluorescence experiments. During this live session, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions by typing them into the GoToWebinar questions box on your control panel. Um, if you're just joining us, welcome again to CST's Learning Lab Live, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Bain. All right, thank you for joining me. As many of us are working to find safe ways to return to the lab, there may be challenges associated with accessing your favorite piece of imaging equipment. So the purpose of this talk is to help you understand the capabilities and limitations of popular imaging equipment. So here are some examples of common imaging equipment. On the left, we have a dissecting microscope. These may be bright field or come in fluorescent varieties. They're typically lower magnification instruments, but may have cameras attached. You can see some images here that I've taken on a dissection scope. They're convenient for showing data at lab meeting or putting data into a poster, maybe even some supporting data for a figure in a publication. The next example here is a benchtop imager. At CST, we use high content imagers on a daily basis. And here you can see a data set that we've generated this way. Benchtop imagers rely heavily on software, but with proper optimization, you can generate useful images here. The workhorse fluorescent microscope of any lab is typically the wide field epifluorescent microscope. What you can do with a microscope like this is determined by the accessories that you purchase for it. I've seen some basic setups that may only image in a few channels, uh, maybe DAPI and GFP, at low magnification. But I've also seen complex setups with incubation chambers, motorized stages, and a gamut of magnifications and filter cubes. So it's important to understand the features of a wide field microscope that's available to you. Finally, on the right here, we have a scanning laser confocal microscope. Now, I imagine that this is the piece of equipment many of you envision generating publication quality images on. Again, for this microscope class, many of the capabilities of this instrument will be determined by the features that are chosen during the purchase of this equipment. Before we dive into instrument features, it's important to consider what objectives are available to you, as well as your experimental needs. So, if you're studying protein expression across tissues, your imaging needs are likely different from people who are studying fine detail within a single cell. The numerical aperture of an objective determines what the resolution limit of that objective is. You can find the NA printed on the side of the objective, and you can calculate the resolution limit in nanometers using the wavelength of light you're working with, uh, two times the numerical aperture of the objective. Uh, a safe rule in imaging is to work with a resolution that's twice as fine as the structure you'd like to resolve. If the structure you're imaging is smaller than the diffraction limit of the lens you're using, then you may incorrectly resolve the structure you're trying to image. Meanwhile, the higher the resolution, or I'm sorry, the higher the magnification, the smaller the field of view that you're going to be able to image. If you need to capture data across a larger field of view, you may want to work with lower magnification objectives, and you could even consider tiling images from many fields of view together. Now let's talk about the basics of operating a wide field epifluorescent microscope. You may recall from the previous IF Learning Lab Live that we talked about filter cubes. So I won't get into the specifics here, but I want to remind you to learn about the filter cubes on your microscope because the specs for these are not standard across all microscopes. An epifluorescent microscope relies on a light source which gives light across the spectrum. This light will be gated by an excitation filter to a smaller wavelength which will excite your sample. Light of a further wavelength in the spectrum is emitted by the fluorophores excited in the sample. And this light is directed through the emission filter to a switchable mirror. From here, light can be directed to the eyepiece or to a camera. While imaging on an epifluorescent microscope is speedy, you're working with all of the light collected from the sample. There aren't many features here to eliminate out of focus light, and the filter sets are broad enough that some background and autofluorescence will likely be imaged if it exists in your sample. When imaging with an epifluorescent microscope, you're working with a relatively sensitive camera. This may be a charge-coupled device or a complementary metal oxide semiconductor. 
both CCD and CMOS cameras work in a similar manner. So here we're going to discuss how CCD cameras work. When light enters the camera, photons encounter a CCD chip. The chip is a two-dimensional array of photodiodes. And as photons encounter the surface of this chip, electrons are liberated from silicon dioxide, and then they're collected in wells beneath the photodiodes. Each of these wells represents a pixel in the final image, and a charge cloud of each well is transferred to an amplifier sequentially and converted to a voltage. This information is then used to assign digital values to each pixel, which is displayed as the grayscale image. While we're able to see fluorescent signal by eye on an epifluorescent microscope, the signal that we're seeing would be considered low light by a camera buff. The cameras that we're using are extremely sensitive, but another way to improve signal to noise is through binning. Now what this means is that the camera is able to combine pixels to give a brighter image. We typically use two by two binning at CST and find that this gives an imageable signal with our camera. Higher levels of binning are also possible, such as four by four or eight by eight. Keep in mind that as your pixels get bigger, representing a larger area of the image, that you will lose resolution. So if you start up your microscope software and see a fuzzy image, check your camera binning and make sure that it's set to the expected settings. <clears throat> when imaging on an epifluorescent microscope, the most powerful tool at your disposal is exposure time. This will determine the number of photons that are allowed to encounter the photodiodes on your camera. Here, I'm showing the difference in image quality for smooth muscle actin when you image at 20 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, and 200 milliseconds. When you're trying to decide what exposure time to use, there's a couple of tools that you can work with. First, if your microscope software displays histograms, this will be a helpful tool to determine when you're detecting meaningful signal. You want to see a curve with some separation between the start and the end of the intensity. Another helpful tool you should use is the range indicator. Range indicators will typically highlight over and under exposed pixels in an image. Red is typically shown for pixels that are saturated, and what this means is that the potential well in the camera is full and that you won't be able to measure the real value of that pixel. You may also see blue for areas that are undersaturated. I recommend adjusting your exposure time until you're able to see only a few saturated pixels because this will allow you to measure the full range of signal in your sample. Now that we've discussed the mechanics of an epifluorescent microscope, it's time to consider the confocal microscope. A laser scanning a confocal microscope relies on lasers to excite the sample. This light is passed through a pinhole so that discrete points of light are directed across the sample with scanning mirrors. Excited light from the sample is then directed toward another pinhole, and this allows you to image in conjugate planes. This is important for eliminating out-of-focus light from reaching the detector. And this is why confocal microscopes are able to take thin optical sections where the thickness is determined by the size of the pinhole. This can generate a much crisper image when you're working with a thick sample. Signal on a confocal is traditionally measured by photomultiplier tubes, although hybrid devices are starting to be used as well. And this may involve incorporating a CCD or other mechanism into the detector. Here, we will discuss the basics of a PMT. Again, photons are directed to a photocathode. Energy is converted from photons to electrons, and electrons are sent into a vacuum tube. Electrons are focused and accelerated onto the first dynode by the focusing electron. I'm sorry, the focusing electrode. Um, and from here, the electrons are amplified by secondary electron emission. And this amplification occurs at each dynode so that you get additional secondary electron emission. Uh, and then all of the electrons are collected at the anode. Uh, and from here, similar to the CCD, current is measured as voltage and converted to signal by the electric, electrical connectors. On the confocal, there are a few ways to manage signal. First would be to increase laser power. By increasing the power of the laser, you're increasing the number of photons that excite your sample, as well as the number of photons that are emitted and detected by the PMT. However, the more energy your sample is exposed to, the more photo bleaching of your fluorophores will occur. Furthermore, increased laser power will also slightly increase the noise in your image. Another setting to consider is the gain of the photomultiplier tube. 
Increasing gain will increase the amount of electrons amplified at the diodes in the PMT. This will increase the signal, but also significantly increases the noise that the PMT will detect. With that being said, higher gain may allow you to use a lower laser power, as we've done here looking at ribosomal S6. Lower laser power will, will reduce the amount of photobleaching in your sample. <clears throat> you can work around some of the problems with gain by introducing additional averaging to your image. So ultimately, finding the right settings for laser and gain is important to generating high quality data. And I encourage you to determine these settings on a non-critical sample or a region within your sample, as this will set you up for optimal image acquisition during your experiment. Because the laser scanning confocal is scanning individual pixels and sending that information sequentially to a PMT, this means that imaging multiple channels and large regions of pixels can be time consuming compared to what you do on an epifluorescent microscope. My typical experiments uh, when I'm taking Z stacks may be 10 to 20 slices thick and imaging each channel and stack at 2082 pixels can take up to 20 minutes per final image. So you may be tempted to scan multiple channels simultaneously to speed up your experiment. You should carefully consider the emission spectra of the fluorophores you're working with if you want to combine channels. <clears throat> if we look at the spectra for DAPI and Alexa Fluor 488, you can see that the DAPI peak is still substantial in the 488 channel, and so there would be some bleed through. The same is true for the Alexa Fluor 555 channel, where both 488 and DAPI would bleed through. There would also be bleed through in the 647 channel, where some Alexa Fluor 555 signal would still be detected. And this could make it difficult to interpret where a specific signal is, both in your individual channels as well as the merged image. It may be possible to combine channels that are further apart in the spectrum. However, depending on the intensity of the dyes used and the amount of dye present in the sample, you may still detect bright signals like DAPI in the 555 channel. Combining Alexa Fluor 488 and 647 may be possible, but again, this depends on the strength of the signals you're working with. If you're trying to save time by combining channels and you're working with both DAPI and Alexa Floor 647, it's mostly safe to try to combine these channels. For best results, I recommend imaging Alexa Floor 488 and 555 as separate tracks to avoid the possibility of spectral overlap. As I mentioned before, the epifluorescent wide field microscope collects light from the entire sample, and this can result in a blurry image when working with thick sections or samples like organoids. You may be able to further resolve an image using deconvolution. This is a mathematical process that enhances resolution by identifying the out of focus light and reassigning it to its original location. Your microscope software may have a deconvolution option included, or you can bring your images to image J and perform deconvolution there. This is definitely an instance where using a confocal gives an advantage over using a wide field microscope. With very thick sections, even when I overlay all of the signal that I collected for each channel, the image is still relatively crisp compared to the wide field images. Furthermore, if you're looking at a single optical section from the confocal, it's easy to resolve where the CD45 and CD4, uh, sorry, CD44 positive cells are within this uh, pyrus patch. Z-stacks add significant time elapse to any experiment. Sometimes a single optical section may be sufficient to capture the relevant information from your sample. Here, I'm showing an example where the single optical section was not sufficient to capture the morphology of microglia. You can see from the top image panel that it's difficult to determine what you're looking at with IVO1 in red. However, making a relatively short Z-stack, we're able to capture the full shape of the microglia. While you can certainly capture a full Z-stack with complete coverage in Nyquist sampling, and this is something you may want to consider when making 3D models of a sample, it's possible to increase the distance between the slices and still capture useful information. And this is a strategy that you could use to reduce how much time it takes to make a ZSAC. <clears throat> We've discussed some strategies for imaging today. However, I want to emphasize a few points about sample and reagent quality because those are quite important as well. You've probably heard the term garbage in, garbage out. And this is an important concept in microscopy. You can spend a lot of time and take incredible images of terrible sample or use invalid antibodies. And ultimately, this will not get you closer to a publication. 
While antibody vendors may perform some level of validation, and at CST, we take antibody validation very seriously. Ultimately, you, the antibody user, should perform validation as well. So in cells, the gold standard for validating an antibody is to use a knockout. If you see signal in an expected cell type, and this signal is lost when you delete the gene responsible for the protein, you can be relatively confident that your antibody is specific. Now, with that being said, Making a knockout is expensive and time consuming. There are some other alternatives which are conceptually similar to using a genetic knockout. There are a lot of cell lines available to a researcher today, and there are great online databases like the CCLE and BioGPS, which provide omics data for these cell lines. So if you choose cell lines where your protein of interest is known to have high gene and protein expression, and another cell line where gene and protein expression are known to be low to negative, you can use this type of model to validate an antibody in your lab. Another source of validation which you should consider is to look for an antibody that's been validated by multiple applications. You'll have more flexibility with an antibody like this because it can work in many different types of conditions. And you can see data performed by multiple independent sets of hands that confirm that this antibody passed validation for each application. Validation in tissue is equally important when possible. Again, you can find omics data for gene and protein expression in tissue from databases like the BioGPS. You can use this data as a guide for which organs you want to look at and then check for expected and unexpected patterns in these tissues. Using valid antibodies is important, but sample quality is also very important for experimental success. Here, I'm showing tissue that's either underfixed or overfixed in formaldehyde compared to tissue that is sufficiently fixed. These conditions will have to be determined in your lab. Um, this is because fixation time will depend on variable factors like temperature, sample thickness, or animal size, and what fixative you're working with. Working with sample where protein can't be detected is going to result in lost time and failed experiments. Finally, when you're sectioning, pay attention to folds and bubbles in your sections. If you know that a fold has happened in a critical region for your experiment, you should throw that slide away. It will be challenging to get useful data from a folded section. So today we've talked about how to obtain optimal images uh, from some of the imaging equipment in your labs. Choosing the right tool for your experiment is important to us here at CST, and so hopefully I've given you some ideas about how and when to use the imaging equipment that's available to you. So now I'm happy to take any IF-related questions you'd like to ask. All right, thank you, Dr. Bain. It looks like we have several questions that have come in. Um, the first one is, what could be the limitations in using epifluorescence microscopy compared with confocal microscopy? Sure, so if you think about the differences between an epifluorescent microscope and a confocal, the biggest one that comes to mind is that the confocal works in these thin optical sections. And so this allows you to eliminate the out of focus light, maybe a little bit of the autofluorescence, especially when you consider that the wavelengths on your confocal are probably more precise and maybe you have a tunable filter set that's even further able to refine what wavelengths of light you're working with. That's not to say that you can't do a lot of the same things on a confocal that you would do on an epifluorescent microscope. Um, it's really important to have good sample quality and to be working with good antibodies so that you can get as much specific signal as possible. Um, one other thing that's different between a confocal and an epifluorescent microscope, uh, if you want to do photon counting, for instance, there you'd really need a confocal to help you out with that. Um, but if you're just doing descriptive patterns or something like that, either instrument should be very helpful to you. Okay. Um... Our second question is, how can I deal with very high background in paraffin-embedded tissues when performing IF? That can be challenging. Um, so when I'm working with paraffin sections, if I have control over the sample, I like to use the briefest fix possible uh, to sufficiently fix the sample to survive the wax. And then I try to use as short of wax washes as possible um, because when you're invaginating wax into sample, it's sitting at high heat. And this can further exacerbate the, the, fluorescence, the autofluorescence problems that you're seeing. 
Um, but there's a couple of other strategies if you don't have any control over your sample, because I know a lot of those paraffin samples are coming from the clinic and they're probably out of your hands. So um, first off, like I showed you with the section thickness, the thinner your section, the less non-specific light you're going to be detecting, no matter what instrument you're on. Um, but if you can take your sample to the confocal, you may be able to further refine what light you're using to excite your sample, um, as well as take those nice thin optical sections. And this is important because the glow that you're seeing is a broad spectrum glow. And so the more specific your signal, uh, the better off you are. Um, another uh, chemical solution that comes to mind, you could work with TSA amplification, where you're going to really boost your signal so that you're not going to have to detect as much of that background. Um, finally, there's some papers published where they, uh, they tried photo bleaching their samples before they started their immunofluorescence experiment. I've tried this with limited success, but it might be worth a shot if your sample is just crazy glowy and that's your only choice. Okay. Um... This one is, do you have any tech tips for IF following in-situ hybridization or simultaneously? Uh, <laughs> that's a fun thing to try to get to work. I uh, fiddled around with that during my postdoc. Um, so uh, if you think about it, you're doing two different protocols here. In-situ hybridization involves um, formamide, high heat, salt stringency washes. Whereas uh, immunofluorescence is a, a gentler protocol, right? Like you're putting antibody on your sample, uh, leaving it in the fridge overnight in some buffers, and it's binding to your epitope, and then the next day you come back and detect that. Um, you can totally combine these two things. However, you're gonna need to find uh, immunofluorescence antibodies that will survive the processing steps for in situ hybridization. Uh, a way to speed this up, I think, would be to take your sample don't use probe, try to process it through some of those uh, in situ steps and make sure that the antibodies that you want to use afterwards will still work. Um, so run your in situ, fix the sample briefly in formaldehyde, and then do your traditional overnight immunofluorescence experiment. Now, I have seen some papers where they've done uh, chromogenic IHC with in situ, and in that case, they actually did the uh, immunostaining first. I think the reason they were able to do this is because chromogenic IHC is depositing things into the sample, not relying on the antibody complex surviving those stringency washes. And so if you wanted to try something similar with IF, you might be able to try a TSA amplification first and then perform your in situ. Okay. Um, our next question is, could you give a gr brief comparison of a couple of common blocking buffers? Okay, yeah, blocking is really uh, useful sometimes. So I should say there's two main classes of blocking buffers. There's um, serum-based blocks, and then there's protein-based blocks. At CST for immunofluorescence, we recommend doing the serum-based blocking step. Uh, and the reason that we recommend this is we're trying to control for variable quality of secondaries that may be used. So you want to include host, uh, I'm sorry, serum from the host of your secondary in your blocking buffer. Uh, however, if you're working with high quality secondaries or if you're um, not trying to publish with what you're working with, like we are doing when we're doing development testing here in the IF group, you may choose to omit that blocking step completely. Um, we've tested this in our group and uh, we can still interpret the data that we need to get from the samples that we're testing. So onto the protein-based blocks. Um, you may be considering using BSA or uh, milk. So with BSA, um, this can sometimes uh, inhibit um, antibodies. We have a couple of those. On, we post on our website if it's not compatible with BSA. Uh, we don't actually recommend using BSA in the IF group for the purpose of blocking. We include it in our antibody dilution buffer for the purpose of antibody stability because we're using antibody in extremely low concentrations. Finally, uh, milk-based blocking. Um, if you are working with a bad antibody and you're trying to uh, resort to milk based blocking for IF, my recommendation to you is to turn to a search engine um, like Cytab or BenchSci and find an antibody that works um, for your target in the application that you wanna do. Because spending a lot of time trying to optimize something which is gonna be variable every time you repeat the experiment can be frustrating and time consuming. Very true. Um, our next question is a customer who is trying to study co-localization, um, and he's 
wondering which piece of equipment will work best if I'm trying to look at two different proteins. Right, so um, this one is a, a hot topic. Um, there's a great review that came out uh, March of this year in uh, Nature, I think it's Methods. At any rate, it's about quantitative confocal microscopy and they have a whole section about co-localization. And the reason that they do this is because co-localization is kind of a, an assumed topic for confocal. You're taking this thin optical section, you have an objective which gives you the resolution of a certain distance and so, if you see overlapping signal on the confocal, you can within confidence say that these two proteins are within a certain distance of each other. That doesn't mean that they're actually in complex. It, um, all it's telling you is the distance. And so if you wanted to prove that they're interacting with each other or in complex, you may have to do further experiments and neither an epifluorescent microscope or a confocal microscope alone is going to be sufficient to get you to your final answer. But even if you see uh, proteins that are overlapping on an epifluorescent microscope, that might be a clue to say, hey, I need to do some further experiments here, um, maybe some pull downs or other experiments to try to prove that they're complex. Okay. Um, let me see what else has come in. Can I image whole brains with a confocal? Right. So um, tissue clearing and imaging entire organs is um, a lot of fun and it's a popular topic uh, recently. Uh, you need to think about the limitations of the microscope. So um, there's a limited working distance for the objectives that you're working with. Uh, and for instance, I tried to image um, 50 micron uh, sections on a confocal, and uh, there was a point at which in that sample, I was no longer able to image. I, I had reached the, the distance, the working distance of my objective. So if you are trying to image whole organs, you're going to need an extremely long working distance objective and those are pretty expensive. Um, also, uh, if you think about the ability of light to penetrate your sample, you're probably going to need to work with a light sheet microscope. Um, a traditional confocal is going to have trouble penetrating the sample with your light. So um, you can totally uh, image whole tissue, um, but you're going to need a lot of specialized equipment to do it. You might instead consider cutting serial sections, maybe 20 or 30 microns thick through the whole organ and imaging those sequentially on a convocal, that's gonna be a long experiment. Um, it looks like we have a follow-up question. What kind of fixation is best for brain tissue and is it better to make frozen slides? So we work primarily with frozen uh, slides in the IF group. Um, I don't have enough knowledge to tell you that frozen tissue is superior to another type in brain. Um, I think people do like free floating slices and sometimes these can be embedded in gelatin and that can work as well. Uh, however, I can tell you that um, for the kind of work that we do, uh, perfusion fixation in formaldehyde is an excellent way to nicely fix the brain. Um, I don't know that that's going to capture exactly the message that you may be trying to if you're doing specific kinds of signaling. So you should definitely look into how other people are fixing their tissue if you're doing a specialized kind of study and make sure that you're not excluding whatever kind of signal that you're trying to detect. Okay. Um, last question for today. Oh, sorry, I just jumped on my screen. What is the difference between an inverted and upright microscope? So inverted microscopes were actually invented um, because of some of the problems with upright microscopes. And there's two main limits to an upright microscope. First off, if you're working with like a really large sample, and this is not so much an immunofluorescence issue as um, if you're working in like chemical microscopy or something where you're imaging just a giant rock. Um, there's a limited like size that you can put a sample between the objectives and the stage in an upright microscope. Um, this is because the objectives are in a fixed position and the stage moves up and down, um, but there's a limited distance that you can move it. Meanwhile, on an inverted microscope, the objectives are beneath the stage, 
and um, the stage is fixed and the objectives move up and down and there's uh, much more space above so you could use a large sample. But the other thing, and this is what's really important to us who do immunofluorescence, is that if you're working with cell culture, um, your cells are probably gonna be on the bottom of a dish. And so if you wanted to use an upright microscope to do this, you'd need a special water dipping objective um, to be able to reach your cells. Whereas if you're working with an inverted microscope, this means that the sample's already at the um, imaging plain and so it's much easier to work with. One last note, um, because this tripped me up when I was a, a new graduate student, if you're working with an inverted microscope, make sure to flip your slides cross side down so that the objective can properly image your sample. Okay, it looks like we're just about out of time. I want to thank you all for joining us today for the Learning Lab Live. Um, please visit cellsignal.com for more information and resources for setting up successful IF experiments and have a great day.